Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Lighter Designs. And uh, if I sound a little bit funny, it's because I'm getting over a, a cold again. It's like my fifth time getting sick this year. Now, being a YouTuber has its ups and downs. I'm always blown away by the really supportive and lovely comments that I get from you guys in the comments section. But every now and then, something happens which absolutely kills me. It's when I get something wrong in one of my videos. Yes, it, it happens. It really annoys me. I literally uh, lose sleep over it. And there've actually been some doozies on this channel over its history. In one video, I called Charles Lytall a Titanic's first officer, which he wasn't. In another one, I called the Canary Islands and Lisbon Mediterranean ports, which they aren't. And in one video, my writer got the year of the warship Vars' sinking wrong by 20 years. <laughs> Now these little errors slip through the cracks to give you some idea why I typically write between five and 10,000 words of scripted content every week for the channel across one or two scripts. So as you can imagine, it's a ton of work. There's a ton of facts and research that goes into it. And I do my best to, uh, to keep it as accurate as possible. But sometimes, you know, something will, will fall through. I really, really hate misinformation, especially historical misinformation. The Titanic has got a ton of uh, historical misinformation surrounding it. So it really, really annoys me when I might put myself in a position where I've made a video that might be a little bit misinformative to people. So today I thought, let's fix that. Last week I published a video on how Titanic's engines worked and I was really proud of it. But then commenters began pointing out some errors in the way that I'd described a few things. And to be entirely honest, while I was a bit sad that I got it wrong in places, these comments were really respectfully put and they were super interesting. They led me down a rabbit hole, and I learned even more about how these incredible machines actually functioned. I'm touched that a lot of the viewers of the channel take time to explain technical things, and often from a place of personal experience. Turns out a lot of viewers of the channel volunteer on uh, actual steam engines and ships like the Jeremiah O'Brien, um, that was the ship that stood in for Titanic's engine room in James Cameron's movie from 1997, um, there are people who work on steam engines and Liberty ships and all kinds of things who are commenting on the video, which is really cool. They actually work on these machines on a week to week basis. So having them weighing in on the, uh, the video was actually really useful and super interesting. And I learned a lot of new extra little bits of information that I thought I might share with you today. Hell, one of my longtime patrons and supporters is a guy called Rainhill, who actually helped out with this video. He's got a great YouTube channel on steam engines. If you like this stuff, you should absolutely go and check out his awesome videos. So today, let's revisit Titanic's engine room, fact check the original video, and learn more about how these absolutely spectacular machines actually worked. First of all, we'll start back in the boiler rooms. In the original video, I gave an outline of how these things worked, and I said this. Three quarters of the inside of the boiler would be filled with seawater, almost 50 tonnes of it drawn from the ocean from small inlets in the ship's hull. It ensured a constant supply of water, and fortunately Titanic was sailing on a near infinite supply of the stuff. Now this is kind of right, but it's not the full story. Let me explain. Viewers were quick to point out that seawater would be absolutely terrible news for a ship's boiler if used drawn straight out of the ocean, and they're completely right. Titanic employed a very involved desalination and filtering process to ensure that all water circulating through the machine systems contained as few contaminants and minerals as possible. I actually wanted to have a deeper look at Titanic's tank and water setup anyway, so this is a good opportunity. The ship's double bottom was a special safety feature that added a second inner skin to the bottom of the ship. It stood about five feet above the keel. Now this inadvertently created a huge amount of enclosed space which designers could use for water storage. The inner spaces of the double bottom were sealed off and segmented into 44 tanks which could hold fresh or salt water for different purposes. Now, using suctions and an array of pumps, up to 5,754 tonnes of seawater could be drawn in for ballast to help balance out the ship's trim as it sat in the water. An imbalance could be bad news. Here's a picture of Olympic with a very noticeable lean to one side. Counter-flooding the ballast tanks could balance this out and return the ship to an even trim. Aside from these salt water tanks, there were also seven freshwater tanks which could hold just under a thousand tons of water, much of it actually used for drinking water. But Titanic's boilers needed to consume a monumental amount of water to keep generating all that steam for the engines, but salt water couldn't be used. 
Now for one thing, salt water and mixing it with iron or steel is obviously a terrible, terrible mix that can lead to severe corrosion over time. The steel or the iron will just get eaten straight through. But even worse for a boiler, running salt water or water rich in minerals through it without filtering any of that stuff out can result in scaling or buildup of materials inside the unit over time, which can be very bad news. Boiling salt water in huge volumes would create a massive amount of leftover salt, which would block the lines and be catastrophic to the whole system. Commenter not 9873 pointed out that a buildup of any kind of scaling, that is minerals in the water that adhere to surfaces over time, can create additional insulation inside the boiler and lead to a buildup of temperature. Now this can lead to a tube or a pipe burning through, sending all that hot gas and fumes back into the furnace and then venting out under extreme pressure through the boiler and into the crew spaces and anyone standing around would be horribly scalded and uh, nobody likes that. Titanic's boilers used what was called feed water, that is fresh water, provided at the start of a voyage by tender. The feed system was ingenious, it was a simple closed loop. The fresh feed water would be boiled in the boilers, turned into steam and then sent through to the main engines, exhausted out, sent through the turbine, cooled and then condensed back into water by the condensers, circulated through filters, back into the boilers to go around again. But over time, as the engines ran for days on end, there would be a natural amount of evaporation or contamination from things like grease or lubricants. The water would need to be topped up, and for this, Titanic's boilers could use seawater to create boiler feed water, it just had to have all of the salt taken out of it first. To do this, Titanic used machines called evaporators to take seawater drawn into the ship and essentially boil the salt right out of it. The evaporators were a kind of heat exchanger. Like the ship's main boilers, they too used a system of tubes, but these tubes were fed by the ship's hot steam. Seawater would come into contact with these extremely hot tubes and boil off into steam, leaving salt deposits behind. And the steam was then cooled, and as it did so, it turned into distilled water. While much of the feed water was condensed and turned into distilled water, a lot more of it was run through the evaporators to remove the excess salt, and then it was dumped overboard. The evaporators could make up to 60 tonnes of distilled water every day. But the distilled water created by the evaporators wasn't used for passenger drinking water. It could, in emergencies, be aerated and circulated as drinking water, but it was mainly used to feed water into the boiler system. Passenger drinking water was stored down in the tanks of the double bottom. It would be pumped up to the boat deck where a holding tank in the engine room ventilator deck house could rely on gravity and pressure in the water pipes that ran up Titanic's funnels to run directly to the taps throughout the ship. Now, later in the video, when I was talking about Titanic's boilers, I said this. Superheated steam was vented through at extreme pressure to drive the colossal pistons of the three-story tall main engines. Now this is flat out wrong. I use the term superheated in kind of like a colloquial sense, like the boilers were super hot. But it turns out superheating is a very specific engineering term and it was not employed on Titanic. A superheated steam system would later go on to power the fastest ocean liner of all time. It's a really interesting little bit of engineering and thermodynamics. To run the engines and turbines, the steam produced by the boilers had to be at a fairly high pressure on Titanic. It would enter the first engine cylinder at 210 pounds per square inch. Titanic steam is what we call saturated steam. Saturated steam was used in machinery through the early years of the 20th century. Essentially, it's steam derived from water heated to a specific temperature for a required pressure, in Titanic's case, 215 pounds per square inch, but saturated steam like that used on Titanic contained minute droplets of water. As it goes through the system, it naturally condenses a little bit as heat is lost, losing steam, volume and pressure. For instance, Titanic's boilers created the steam at 215 pounds per square inch, but it reached the engines at 5 psi less. Now, as it dropped in temperature, it would naturally condense and create water droplets. Now, this would be bad news for the engine. So to deal with this, Titanic steam lines featured separators, which were designed to catch water droplets and remove them before the steam actually entered the engine cylinders. But in later years, a new system was adopted. This would heat the boiler water to create steam, but it would then be heated again. It would be high above the condensation temperature of water vapour and contain an enormous amount of internal energy. The SS United States used boilers that used this system, called superheating. 
the SS United States superheating boilers heated steam just shy of a thousand degrees Fahrenheit and up to a thousand pounds per square inch, one of the secrets of that ship's incredible top speeds. In Titanic's day, superheating technology was relatively new. It had been used on locomotives in the late 1800s, but in 1912 it had finally only just made its way to the Admiralty. The HMS Bristol was the first warship to employ superheated boilers. Superheating provided a huge amount of power in an economical way, but it needed a lot more maintenance which could be costly, and a failure or crack in any of the lines would be absolutely catastrophic. Another few small points, I mentioned the boiler's fire tubes would get red hot. This was a bit of an exaggeration on my part, it's true the tubes would get extremely hot as the gases from the boiler furnaces were vented through them, but while they boiled off the boiler's feed water into steam, in turn the feed water cooled the tubes so they wouldn't glow red hot and would stay at a manageable temperature. Later on, I also said this. The 159 furnaces could heat around 144,000 square feet of water, a monumental volume. <laughs> now a few of you pointed out that uh, yeah, square feet is not a measure of, of volume. This is a slip of the tongue. Titanic's boilers uh, could heat with the tubes a certain surface area and that would in turn boil a huge volume of water. It's really impressive stuff. Speaking of boilers and steam pressure, later on in the video, I said this. The triple expansion engine's secret to success was the fact that it could capture the power of the steam from 210 pounds per square inch all the way down to 24 pounds per square inch before exiting, totally exhausted, at 9 pounds per square inch, which is actually below the pressure of Earth's atmosphere. Now, a lot of people were quick to point out they thought I got this wrong, but I'm happy to say that this is actually correct. Commenter James Rivette helpfully pointed out that pressure was usually measured using a special scale to outline the steam's pressure above the Earth's atmosphere. For example, Earth's atmosphere is 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute. Now the steam exited Titanic's main engines at 9 pounds per square inch, and a lot of commenters pointed out at the time and today that working steam pressure numbers were usually not recorded as pounds per square inch absolute, but pounds per square inch gauge. Now this essentially measures the pressure above Earth's atmosphere, so it eliminates that 14.7 pounds per square inch number by already taking it into account. So 9 pounds per square inch gauge would really, once you add back 14.7 pounds per square inch of Earth's atmosphere, would be running at 23.7 pounds per square inch absolute. But every source I found indicates that Titanic's turbine took steam in at a pressure of 9 pounds per square inch absolute. This comes from an article in the Shipbuilder in 1911, which says, the low pressure turbine, which is of the usual Parsons type, will take steam from the reciprocating engines at about nine pounds absolute pressure and exhaust at one pound absolute. Now this is why I explained that the pressure of the steam would be below Earth's atmosphere. Nine PSI absolute is below 14.7 PSI absolute after all. Now this was for good reason. It was all to do with the quest to extract as much power and efficiency out of those engines as possible. Contemporary graphs and information from the age show that in the triple expansion steam engines of the time, 33% of the power extracted from the steam was done so in conditions below Earth's atmospheric pressure. The turbine running at a pressure below Earth's atmosphere pressure would actually assist the main engines. It would draw steam through the main engine cylinder, greatly increasing efficiency and power. The whole engine system was connected. The condensers themselves at the end of the system operated in a vacuum, 28 inches of mercury vacuum created by the cooling of the steam itself. As the steam condenses, both its temperature and volume decrease, which in turn cause the pressure within the condenser to drop. Titanic also employed huge pumps to service the condensers, removing condensate from the steam and maintaining that vacuum. On ships like this, the power of the pumps and the vacuum in the condenser unit is such that running the pumps could turn the engines on vacuum alone. Now, engines that didn't use a system like this extracted steam above Earth's atmospheric pressure only, but they wasted a huge amount of heat and energy because of it. This was even recognised at the time, in fact, some early engines extracted 60% of their power from steam below Earth's atmospheric pressure, and James Watt's engine ran purely in a vacuum, 100% of its power below the pressure of Earth's atmosphere, and in the ever-evolving quest for power and efficiency, Titanic's engines 
used every trick in the book to extract as much power from the steam as possible. Actually, while we're on the topic of the main engines, let's revisit the way they, uh, they functioned, because uh, later on in the video, I said this. In its most basic form, a reciprocating engine worked by injecting pressurized steam, expanding it within the cylinder to lift the piston before the steam was evacuated from the cylinder and the piston dropped. Do this again and again, and the result is that the crankshaft will turn. But that's not completely true. This describes a single acting steam engine, where steam is only expanded to push the piston up. Early on, it was realized that more power was needed. So by introducing valves, steam could be injected at the top of the stroke as well, forcing the piston down. This was called a double acting engine. Titanic's engines worked like this. It was a simple arrangement. Turning the engine would operate a slide valve, which as it went up and down, would admit steam under pressure, either at the bottom of the stroke sending the piston up, or at the top of the stroke, sending the piston back down again. And this would happen over and over again, creating an immensely powerful and efficient engine. Another thing I got picked up on was this. But here the enormous Olympic class ships, each 10,000 tons larger than the Cunarders, used more reliable, more economical engines, and at full steam they were only two or three knots slower than their rivals. Lusitania burned a thousand tons of coal per hour at least, but Titanic, the much larger ship, only burned 600. Now this was actually a slip of the tongue. What I meant to say was Lusitania would burn around about a thousand tons of coal per day, not per hour. I know a lot of you were, uh, were very happy to say that yes, getting the firemen to burn about a thousand tons of coal per hour might have been asking <laughs> a little bit too much of them. As if their job wasn't already hard enough, right? But it also offers a fascinating glimpse into just how well designed Titanic's engine system was. The numbers are fascinating and very telling. Lusitania and Mauritania were built and specifically designed for speed, and they accomplished this with raw power. Four hugely powerful turbines each, outputting nearly 70,000 horsepower. But Olympic and Titanic were 10,000 tons larger than the Cunard ships, and they burned 73% less coal, and were, after all that, only two or three knots, that's 3.4 miles per hour, or five kilometers per hour slower. And you can see just how clever the hybrid propulsion engine system that Harland and Wolf chose to use on Titanic actually was. It was engineering genius. So there you have it, deeper insight into how Titanic's engines actually worked. I really enjoyed learning more about these things. I find them absolutely fascinating. I can't believe that they even made machines like that to that kind of scale. As always, thank you so much for your wonderful comments. Stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.